So we have a coalition government, as you know, sometimes it's difficult to run the coalition government. Europeans know about that, and we have also division of power. And what is also important to stress that Parshanka is not all powerful <coughs> president, according to constitution and according to the composition of the power, which I think is good, because again, it prevents monopolization of power. So I believe in this sphere we can say very clearly that Ukraine is with all the problems, but it's, it has democratic government, which is functioning. Again, there are many of problems, but basic constitutional design and electoral system, you know, they created this uh, system where the monopolization of power was prevented. prevented. Now, the what definitely changed the dynamics of the agenda? And Arkady Moshe's in previous panel actually he said all these things we are Ukrainians saying at home. That definitely the war is not justification for not conducting reforms. But I assume, and I'm pretty sure that definitely if there would be no war, there would be another agenda and another dynamics. As an example, it would be very difficult in time of peace after the revolution to imagine Oleg Kolomoisky who will be who would be appointed as the governor of Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, Dnipropetrovsk region. But it happened because it was necessary to stabilize the situation in Dnipropetrovsk region and it produced positive results at that time. Now, we have now very difficult interconnection between the necessity of reforms and reforms are painful, <coughs> many of them are not popular, Simultaneously, three rounds of elections. Simultaneously, you have freedom of media with possibility to criticize president, prime minister, and everybody. And every journalist in my country is enjoying this freedom to criticize the authorities. It's easy to do right now. And again, it's, it's difficult to combine all of it in times of war. You know that usually in times of war, the Western Western government, they are not conducting reforms. And they are not conducting reforms, say, one year before election, right? You are doing reforms after you have the, reform, the election cycle finished. But we need to do it. Everything at once. Myself, I would, I would declare emergency situation in Ukraine, for example, since January, this year, when there was an escalation in the front, I was in favor of that, but Parshan decided different. If we had emergency situation, we would have the constitutional possibility to postpone local elections. And I was in favor of postponing local elections, at least in Donbass. Again, the explanation is that it's difficult and almost impossible to conduct local elections in time. But nevertheless, Parshan decided different. So he tried to demonstrate that we're still using democratic mechanism, mechanism, um, democratic mechanism. Now, some important things have been done, like creation of anti-corruption bureau, creation of new police, which have a very high rating of approval, non-corrupt police. Um, now, there are changes which should be introduced, constitutional changes which should be introduced to change the judicial system. And these changes, they uh, received positive response from the Venice Commission. But definitely, you know, these are the reforms which will produce results, say, in middle or uh, mid-term or long-term run. So they are creating the basis for reforms. And in the meantime, the economic situation, is very, very difficult. And people are frustrated not only with uh, uh, economic situation, but also with justice and fighting corruption. And they are asking why people who were responsible for repressions in Maidan are not punished, why people who were responsible for separatism, and by these people, we understand these are people from Yanukovych entourage, those people who were close and are close to form a party of regions, why they are not punished. So again, as I have explained to you, we are just creating a new legal system to doing that. And also, uh, in time of war, it's very delicate to 
destabilize the balance in the correlation of forces, including the oligarchs. Okay, so you cannot stop the oligarchization attacking all the oligarchs at once because it will destabilize the system. So, these are the other explanations which I, as analyst, can suggest. But again, people are not satisfied with that. Having said that, I would stress that the Ukraine experience shows that the country will have reforms done not in radical way, but in evolutionary way. Through adopting of the new laws, through lobbying through the parliament, lobbying to executive power, and so on and so forth. And definitely, as I have said, it's necessary to see the to see the results. So this is one of the problems which we face. Local elections. Um, I have criticized the present law on elections, local elections. I can elaborate on that. But as a result, what we've seen, as a result of the local election, again, there is no monopoly of power for any political party, neither presidential party no opposition bloc, which is composed of the remnants of part of region, including in Donbass, which is very interesting. Again, as I have said, I was against conducting elections in Donbass, but activists from there, they said, no, we are having a really competitive atmosphere in Donbass. First for two decades. First for two decades, you have the competition in Donbass. True, in many cities, opposition bloc got the majority. But in general, the monopoly of opposition bloc, former party, former even college supporters, now doesn't exist anymore, even in the past. According to the results of uh, local election, I think they show that perhaps despite the demands from some forces in the parliament for early parliamentary elections, there is no real base for that, for early elections, parliamentary elections. And I think this is good. Because now we had early parliamentary elections last year. These elections, last year elections, they created working majority in the parliament. And to have early parliamentary elections now again would play into the hands of those who would like to destabilize the situation in Ukraine. Within the ruling coalition, there are different differences visible differences, there are potential slits, splits, but I would stress that for having 226 votes, which is simple majority, I assume the presidential party and prime minister's party, they would have enough, enough votes. With certain difficulties, but still. One of the explanations is actually that the rating of prime minister party went down, so they're not simply not interested having early elections, so they would side with Poroshenko. But I believe, again, this is good because there is a possibility, there is a possibility um, to adopt laws and to escape early parliamentary elections. Having said that, I would stress that definitely to collect 300 votes for constitutional changes, including for uh, those changes which are demanded by Minsk II agreements would be difficult. And theoretically, Parashanka could, could get 300 votes, but with support of opposition bloc. And that would, have, that would be very damaging for his ratings, for his social, it will erode actually his social. So there are also, you know, limitations for that. And I will stop here, and I save one minute and a half, which I give to Maria Zuka. Excellent. So we, uh, I forgot to tell you that none of the speakers will exceed 10 minutes. We agreed that this will be the most disciplined panel, and Maria will continue with this. By the way, how many more Ukrainians do we have in the room? Uh, would you please raise your hands? Who, who is? Who is here from Ukraine? Embassy or some NGO? So we, you, so we have you. You are from Ukraine and we have one more. Okay, two more. Yeah, I know, excellent. Fine, perfect. Okay, so 
you listen carefully because you will have chance to step in first during discussions, but Maria, now I'm not going to take your time, your 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, devoting uh, the separate panel and the whole conference towards this important issue and for giving us the possibility to speak about current developments in Ukraine from different perspectives. Because a lot of internal and uh, like domestic, uh, political and social, social developments, they are out of information space when we come to foreign media, when we come to Western understanding of what is going on in the country, and we have a lot of things which can actually contribute to understanding of the current constellation of uh, political and social processes within Ukraine. So speaking about the current situation, uh, about the most important issues connected to the issue of reform, connected to the aspect of uh, public moves, public opinions, uh, connected with uh, domestic political processes, I would say that reforms and demand for reforms is the issue which unites Ukrainian society, unites all the regions, all the populace of Ukraine, not only in general, on a general level, on the average level. People have the same demand all over Ukraine towards complete reforms. Anti-corruption reform and fighting corruption on all the levels is the reform which is priority number one. Uh, in all regions of Ukraine, including the Bas, including West, and all other macro regions, uh, macro parts of Ukraine. When we speak about uh, what is the priority number two, then we come to the to the level of uh, actually securing people's rights. People demand judicial reform, which has uh, slowly but started. Actually, at least we have the concept and we have the conclusions on the side of this commission, as Mr. Garan said. We, we have a demand for prosecutor's office reform, we have the demand for uh, the, um, the system of interior reform, and it is also a demand which is uh, present, which is demonstrated by people all over Ukraine. So this is the basis which unites Ukraine, and this is the common demand which society uh, sends, which is the, like a signal towards authorities. And um, what is very important in my, uh, in my opinion when we speak about reforms is despite the war tempers and despite um, complete problems that we have with the implementation of complete transformations within the country, people are still uh, not radicalized in, uh, let's say, their expectations. So they are ready to, um, to wait for, for a while, for some time actually, uh, maybe not for long, but still uh, up to 40% of Ukrainians, about 67-68% of Ukrainians are ready to wait for success in the area, in the field of reforms, not for a long time, but up to one year. Uh, and this situation it looks uh, less positive than was uh, one uh, half a year ago, when there were more than 40% of people ready to wait uh, up to one year, but nevertheless, we don't have, um, in this area, we have some kind and some space of hope, credit of uh, trust towards uh, the idea that reform actually are possible. At the same time, I would like to speak about uh, the process of reforms within Ukraine um, from different perspectives, from several perspectives. One of these uh, perspectives is that how it is connected with the idea of Ukraine-Ukraine relations uh, and the idea of European integration of Ukraine. On the other hand, I would say that uh, it is important to look how uh, people understand what is going on in the area of domestic transformations and in the area of uh, relations of Ukraine with its Western partners, which are very helpful in conducting or in pushing those reforms process within Ukraine ahead. So if we will speak about uh, how you uh, relations with you matters for domestic reform, it matters uh, uh, to, to a great extent actually, as never before, because we have uh, the new quality and new era of Ukraine-EU relations, according to the new framework, which is association agreement. On the other hand, we have new era in new Ukraine relations in terms of public perceptions of what European integration is and what uh, the role of the EU actually is. And speaking about this very important, in my opinion, um, 
part of relation relations, how it is perceived by ordinary people in Ukraine, because this perception they create the basis for understanding of what is going on and for uh, legitimizing uh, different decision making, um, especially in the area of reform. So we, I would like to make several emphasis. First of all, um, any kind of foreign policy or integration dualism exists in Ukrainian society or Ukrainian public opinion anymore. The idea of joining any kind of political or economic union with Russia on a post or on a post service phase with customs union or Eurasian economic union as of now, this dualism doesn't exist anymore in Ukrainian society. This idea of integration in this direction is not supported by Ukrainian society. More than 60% of Ukrainians are against such, uh, such option of integration. People started choosing uh, alternative of moving towards membership in the European Union rather than standing um, outside of any union or moving towards the Eurasian Union. Even um, several years ago, when the, the power of Yanukovych was rather stable, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this choice, this pro-European choice, is supported by a refusal of people in South. East and even in liberated areas of Donbass from the idea of becoming closer uh, to integration um, uh, unions on the post Soviet space. And those changes of public perception, they are still um, extreme, extreme significance because it is south, east, and Donbass of Ukraine. It is in this part of Ukraine, the main part of people looking towards deeper relations with Russia were uh, actually. And uh, during 2014 and during 2015, it, um, significant changes uh, appeared uh, in these regions. Uh, people became disappointed in any kind of integration with Russia, and at the same time, uh, this is the space for maneuver, and this is the opportunity to uh, uh, show these people the new quality of uh, how uh, European integration, in terms of practice, in terms of empirics, in terms of concrete reforms, according to association agreement, according to DCTA, should look like actually. And this is actually a chance, and this is a difficult task one to show people, to pursue them, persuade them uh, with the, uh, the new kind of quality of uh, Ukrainian new relations. Speaking about how um, actually people assess what is going on in terms of uh, the role of uh, the European Union in the domestic processes of Ukraine and in terms of a new role in the light of Russian and Ukrainian conflict, which is very important because the position of the new member states will definitely influence public perceptions and public moods uh, all over the country. Uh, to about the European integration in general, and this is uh, why I'm insisting so much on public opinion within the country, because this is actually the basis for political stability, and this is the basis for social stability. If people understand, and if people perceive correctly what is going on, then uh, they will react in a concrete way uh, towards uh, decisions made by domestic political elites and towards proposals which are presented by our Western partners. So if we speak about the role, how the role of uh, uh, you uh, is uh, perceived by people, so people are um, um, uh, rather positively assess the role of um, the perspective of deepening relations with the EU. They see that it, it corresponds with the interests of Ukraine. They see that it can uh, help strengthening the position of uh, Ukraine on the international arena. They uh, see that uh, it is important for economic success of Ukraine. And here we come to very important uh, issues. If people believe that deepening relations with the European Union at the present moment is important for economic success of Ukraine, then we have a great challenge, uh, which is implementation of this FTA from January 1st, 2016, because in a short-term perspective, it can bring some painful results for ordinary people or some misunderstanding which will be uh, exaggerated by Russian propaganda, which is uh, still rather uh, strong even inside Ukrainian informational space. So this is a challenge, and it will actually it can actually influence public um, like uh, opinion and uh, public opinion within the country. If people believe that deepening relations with you will have to will help to strengthen the you know, position of Ukraine in the international arena, then uh, we have. Um, Special emphasis on the position of the EU in the light of Russia and EU conflict. 
if supports or if proposals which are uh, made by the West would be perceived by ordinary people as a pressure, then we will have not only disappointment, we will have uh, some kind of um, uh, lack of trust both to domestic political elites which are partners of the West in this um, process and towards uh, the European idea in general. If we speak about what is what should be done actually and what should be uh, what what uh, uh, should be done from ordinary people point of view, then sanctions should be either preserved under the same level or should be strengthened. More than 60% of Ukrainians are in favor of such a perspective. And one more point: speaking about uh, the current uh, crisis, the current Russian-Ukraine conflict. Uh, in terms of uh, people's point of view, um, the main measures which can actually bring stability and peace in the region, uh, not in the region but after the conflict, which can bring to uh, uh, solving this conflict, is uh, conducting elections but strictly according to uh, Ukrainian legislation, is uh, restoring the control of Ukraine over the Russian-Ukraine border, and disarmament of so-called uh, uh, people from DPR and LPR. It means that without taking into account all these uh, tendencies and all these perceptions which are presented in the area of public opinion within the country, we will never find a strategic solution for the conflict and for, the, for um, actually implement, implementing uh, Ukraine new relations in a mid-term or in a long-term perspective in general. Excellent. Thank you very much, Maria, and we are moving to EU perspective on Ukraine, Katarina, please. Thank you very much, Paolo, and uh, thanks for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start, let me uh, just make a note on the EU versus uh, EC versus EU, any, any other acronym uh, point. I uh, represent here the European Commission, and more specifically, uh, Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations. And as you could hear from the, uh, even the statement by uh, Foreign Minister Leitchak this morning, uh, there is quite a complexity in EU decision making and uh, Ukraine relations with Russia and many other issues uh, are exactly those where the interplay between the, what is, uh, agreed upon to be the, the EU driver for a specific policy is very, uh, very often then confronted with and occasionally even thwarted by uh, the wish of the member states. So I just want to say I'm going to be speaking about uh, on behalf of the EC and not the EU as such. And I have uh, learned my lesson in uh, several of uh, last public uh, engagements that I don't shy away from, but I learned my lesson to make this disclaimer at the beginning also for, for broader understanding that the decision making uh, in the block of 28 is indeed complex and uh, whatever, whatever I say and whatever is the policy of our part of uh, the Commission that is providing the assistance and the concrete support to not only Ukraine but, uh, but countries in the both eastern and southern neighborhood and enlargement countries uh, doesn't necessarily pan out that way when it goes through the entire filter of the of, of the of the complex new uh, decision making. Um, inspired a little bit by the comments of uh, Ambassador Popov this morning, who uh, emphatically spoke about the lack of uh, uh, Moldova and others in the in the program of. Of, uh, this conference, which uh, I think that the conference had a very, very clear, very clear, as in and very clear um, uh, agenda, but a uh, little bit inspired by this plea, I thought I would give a, uh, rather than speak only about Ukraine, give a little bit of a flavor of the uh, European neighborhood policy review that is currently uh, taking place. Uh, it's expected to be adopted by the, by the Commission and then discussed in the uh, various council formations uh, on the 18th of uh, November. So it's in, a, in a few days it's, it's going to be hot off the press, but uh, I thought it may be interesting to a little bit discuss it, uh, a little bit discuss it here. 
Um, as uh, as uh, all of you know, the European neighborhood policy was was uh, an animal that came into being in 2009, and and that covers the neighborhood both to the east of the EU and to the south of the EU. And already at the time of its creation, there were a uh, number of questions about why why combining under one policy and under one instrument, financial instrument, uh, countries that are so vastly different as uh, Morocco and Moldova or uh, Syria for that matter and, and uh, Georgia. Um, several years into and one one uh, one financing round uh, into into it, I think that that decision has proven very correct uh, for a very simple reason that it kept all of the member states interested in it. If you had two different policies, you would you would immediately have. Uh, interest of the of this part of the world more interested in the eastern uh, neighborhood policy and, and, and in other countries the mediterranean and france etc more interested in the in the uh, southern neighborhood uh, so keeping it together and that's the intention also to to uh, go forward uh, like this is to have one instrument one policy that covers all of it uh, very importantly, to keep uh, to keep uh, all of the member states uh, engaged and interested. Now, that doesn't mean to uh, say that everything was all ideally thought through the first time around. And I think that uh, time has uh, proven, experience has proven that the policy needs to be a lot more differentiated uh, than it was uh, before, or than it was thought through as, as uh, at its inception. And so differentiation and a more tailor-made approach uh, is one of the key aspects of the review of the policy. Um, uh, essentially, the countries that have both the will and the capacity to get into a closer uh, association in the EU will be welcome to do so. Um, like the three countries in the east, one in the south, that have signed uh, the VCFTAs and association agreements. And, uh, and those that don't have that interest, uh, more uh, tailor-made approaches will be, will be sought. So um, we are also looking at the architecture, and I'm reminded of the uh, time, so I'm going to be brief and we can get back to it through the Q&A. Um, we also are adjusting the, the regular reporting uh, structures about the action plans and we'll be negotiating through, through partnership priorities <coughs> and we are also dropping the, or planning to drop the current approach to uh, reporting. So no more annual ENP packages, uh, but rather uh, fold the reporting into uh, much more revived association councils, like there's going to be one on uh, Ukraine in, uh, in early December. So that's just a, a flavor of what is uh, coming. And now a few comments on Ukraine, rather than just, just commenting on what I heard from the two previous speakers, um, um, who are both Ukrainian, and uh, I also have the uh, same same instincts uh, whenever looking at the reforms that Slovakia was uh, was pursuing that we tend to be always self-critical. So I just want to say that I think that uh, Ukraine has made an impressive uh, set of reforms, not only in the areas that you mentioned, whether it's the constitutional reforms or, or the inroads into uh, rule of law, which still obviously need to be need to be implemented, but the vision is there, the ideas are there. I think it was equally impressive the way the economy got stabilized. That we suddenly don't talk about uh, Ukraine being on the precipice of a, of, of a fall down, the, the deal with, uh, with the Paris Club of uh, bondholders has, has been very swift and, and, and quick, the very nice stabilized. The banking sector reforms, you know, your neighboring Moldova could only envy. Uh, so there is a lot has happened. Uh, there are obviously challenges, uh, and I think that there is a danger of uh, stopping in the middle of the river 
and, and not really reaping the, the, the benefits, you are obviously under a huge challenge apart from the uh, war situation, under, under huge uh, Russian propaganda that is undermining the reform process, we all know that. But I think that one issue that, that uh, I would say that hasn't been so far properly addressed, especially in the reform areas, and I think the, the, the lady before that, uh, that spoke, uh, Maria, mentioned it, to be able to keep the public on the side of the reformers, a lot more communication needs to take place, a lot more communication towards the population so they start to <coughs> the benefits of the painful reforms, and also communications towards the, the uh, skeptical parts of the European uh, member states, because we saw the, one of the big boring signs, uh, we all watched a Dutch referendum on the association agreement coming almost out of nowhere. So these are issues that, that really require communication and perseverance, <coughs> and I, I hope that uh, both will us through the difficult period there. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, Kasia, now, Ukraine was dreaming about signing association agreement. Ukraine is associated member. So how does it feel to have this EU now associated member so complicated as Ukraine? Thank you very much. I guess that Ukraine is not associated member. Backlash. If we think about this with new Pacific Agreement, the equivalent would be if China basically did something to Vietnam for signing an agreement with, with the US. So it's a fascinating agreement. Um, and it's also very complex. I'm not going to ask who's read the agreement, apart from Katarina, who's, but it's a, I have to say, uh, for anybody with a legal background, it's a masterpiece. It's 2000 or very well uh, structured. An agreement, but it's also incredibly ambitious and complicated. It was negotiated, took four years to negotiate, so it was sort of um, long in the making, and now it has to be implemented in a relatively sort of under very specific and difficult conditions in Ukraine, but also the expectations are massive. And almost I feel they sort of like mm, the agreement is mystified. It's like a sort of fairy, a fairy tale solution to Ukraine's problems. And if you think what Ukraine has taken in the association agreement, it's been basically offered to become a Norway in 10 years. Basically, taking relatively, not exactly the same, the legal formula is different, but the uh, taking on about 90% of the acute commuter on a unilateral basis without the membership perspective which was mentioned by Minister Leiter. So this is unprecedented voluntary sort of unilateral sort of opening of the country like Ukraine to accept EU rules. The problem with EU rules, they, are, they rest on the premise that the countries which adopt them have the capacity, I'm not talking about will, but have capacity actually to uh, implement them. And this is where, where I think the difficulty lies, because many problems which the association agreement is supposed to resolve, it's actually the lack of those things is there and hampers the implementation of the agreement. Like the dysfunctional, basically non-functioning court system in Ukraine, weak property rights, uh, massive corruption, and very weak capacity of the state institutions. And one of the major issues that every single presentation on Ukraine mentions is corruption. And corruption in the post-Soviet space is a survival strategy for people working for the state. You cannot survive on civil servant salaries. You have to create your own business out of your official position. Ukraine is now, everybody is poorer in Ukraine. And now asking people to cut off basically their sort of um, extra income from their state position it's very demanding until and unless 
We have a system, civil service sort of reform, which allows people and to know that they are able to survive without resulting to corruption. And we know how um, Saakashvili did it. And I think Saakashvili did a very interesting thing while um, in, in Georgia, and he's repeating this now in Odessa. Saakashvili didn't reform the post Soviet institutions. He regarded them as corrupt and dysfunctional. He abolished them. It was easier and fast to abolish them rather than reform. And this is what Ukraine is now um, facing in a way, that it has to, while experiencing this, sort of this euphoria of democratization, has to, at the same time, introduce very painful, delayed reforms, which it hasn't done for the last 25 years. And this is sort of the, 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 the problem solving, the problem solving dealing with very specific, pro specific problems that the population is facing is now sort of rough under the implementation of the agreement. And I, I think this is, in a way, the recognizing what are the preconditions for the effective implementation of the association agreement is really the homework which has not yet been done. It's all, everything is grouped together, lumped together under the same heading. Having said that, what we have is flexibility. And I would really like to um, sort of praise the, the Commission for this very flexible uh, approach. And although I want perhaps one more qualification to um, how to your statement, it's about we actually don't have, the association agreement is not fully implemented yet because the economic part is only going to be implemented. I regard the suspension of the implementation of the DCFTA in September last year as a bad precedent. It's for the first time that the EU agreed to suspend a part of its agreement, but due to pressure from a third country. And pressure was on rather sort of in, in substantive grounds. Having said that, in England we have the saying, every cloud has a silver lining. Uh, so even bad things have sort of good, uh, good results. And uh, Ukraine was definitely not ready to implement the DCFDA. It's still not ready. Uh, but at least there's um, a bit more time to prepare. And in the meantime, Ukraine has been benefiting from the autonomous trade preferences. So, Ukrainian businesses, but we also know from it what works and what doesn't. For certain products, quotas are almost too generous. Ukraine has no capacity to export certain products to the EU. For other products where it can actually export, the quotas are too low. Sometimes they are fulfilled in two, three months. So there is scope and there is also flexibility in the association agreement. Because in contrast to the previous generation of agreements, the PCA is a living agreement. It can be changed by the agreement of both sides. And there's a, little, um, a lot of scope for that. And in a way, using sort of that, that decision-making capacity, I hope it will be done to ensure that actually the association agreement and the DCAT especially starts bringing the benefits sooner rather than later. Hence, sort of, delivering to the Ukrainian public and um, state the benefits because we don't have this luxury of waiting five to eight or to ten years as was originally envisaged uh, when the association agreement was <coughs> And perhaps this is what we have, just one uh, or two for just final points. And I think I was, um, I found Minister Lajczak's presentation very interesting from the point of view the deficits that he mentioned, the deficit of vision. Before it was everything about will Yanukovych sign the association agreement or not, what do we do, you know, the conflict and Crimea kept us away. What is the vision now for the relations? And the vision is the implementation of the association agreement. And it's just about as exciting as it sounds. Um, and we have no conditionality, basically, apart from market access for uh, products. And also, what we don't have, what well, is proper coordination mechanism. Uh, Ukraine and is, in a way, one could say, flooded with, flooded with uh, assistance, but there is no coordination uh, as such. And this brings us to the point that I think it's very interesting to hear in Bratislava to the point there is no really, everything has changed and nothing has changed in a way. That the Eastern Partnership 
has not really found a substitute for however distant, however vague and mythicized membership perspective. Not only for the countries themselves, but for the EU. The, basically how the EU was focused on helping the transformation process um, is, uh, is amazing. And so focusing the mind on both sides of the um, an association agreement. What is, I think, for the moment, what works paradoxically is the Russian factor. The perception, what Maria said, that Ukraine has nowhere else to go, and the association agreement is the only game in town. So, for the time, Russian actions, ac actions imbued the EU and the association agreement with the qualities which otherwise it would not have been there. But, and that's the final point, the Moldova syndrome. The Moldova syndrome is that many, many, you know, who knows a lot about Moldova? I think Slovakia is one of the countries where, which know most about Moldova amongst the EU member states. The EU was so desperate for a success story that Moldova was nominated such a success story. And the blind eye, and I was, that's the first time here, Mr. Lajczak said the words, calling things by their names that the EU misused its leverage in Moldova, or did not apply it properly. Closed a blind eye to corruption, to misuse of the European choice, as basically a plan, as a card for the ruling elites to basically privatize the country and steal from, from the country. So this is, and the EU has certainly not used, was had no political strong role in Moldova, and I'd like to see it in Ukraine um, as well. And this is important, that the political role is fully utilized. So not just talking about the need for reforms, but calling and criticizing, naming and shaming the very specific actions of the authorities in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, which go very much against the uh, spirit of the association agreement. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Garcia. I think that here in Slovakia, we are not closing guy vis-a-vis -vis Moldova, but also vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Two of our politicians, Ivan Mikulov, who is advisor to finance minister, Mikula Zurinda, who is, I think, advising president, several times open, we were pointing to shortcomings of Ukrainian policy making. But I think that we may come to that during discussion. Grzegorzyla, the last one, so you heard already several interesting opinions, both from within Ukraine and from EU, and also if you could wrap it up with a few sets of comments, remarks from your side, and then we'll open it for uh, discussion among participants. Thanks. Thank you very much. I will try to be very brief. Uh, I think that one and a half year after we done the time for an assessment of Ukrainian reforms and we should be very frank to avoid the mistake which happened in the case of Moldova it was mentioned by, by Mr. Leiter morning and uh, now for sure uh, this uh, uh, current government current president in Ukraine they are the most pro-reform oriented authorities in the history of, of independent Ukraine so our important changes were done, and, and Alexa <coughs> mentioned these uh, changes, these reforms. However, in my opinion, uh, the path of reforms is uh, slow, it's too slow. And uh, they are still unfinished or partially done. And an example, visa liberalization action plan implementation is uh, a proof that uh, these uh, reforms are still unfinished, unfortunately. And uh, unfortunately, Ukraine is now behind not only Moldova in this respect, Moldova <coughs> has three visa free regime from uh, in, uh, spring 2014, but in my also behind Georgia. So, Situation is even worse in the last few months than earlier. What are the reasons for, for this situation? Four, four problems, from four, four challenges at least. First, I agree that reforms in, in Ukraine is an enormous task. 
one example only, namely the reformer judiciary system. This system is so corrupt that judiciary should be rebuilt from the scratch. But this is not a realistic solution. So I don't have an answer to what should be done. Second reason, it was also mentioned several times here in the room, war, Russia's military action in Congress. For sure, it's very important reason for slow path of reform. However, the more important, in my opinion, is a strong resistance of various interest group which want to preserve the old political, <coughs> the old system in politics and, and, and business. Such persons uh, like Igor Kolomoisky or Inat Ahmed are still very influential and local elections uh, show this. But these two persons are only a tip of the iceberg. The other problem is bureaucracy in general, which is, of course, <laughs> for a status quo, not for changes. But, in my opinion, the main problem is an old thinking doing politics by the ruling elite. They are, of course, not autocrats. They are democrats. However, they cannot ever overcome their habits. It is not only a problem of their fear about their interests, but, in my opinion, it is a problem psychological. They are still, to some extent at least, a part of the whole system. For, for instance, Poroshenko, I agree with you, Alexei, that he is not a powerful man. He cannot do all things. But Poroshenko, in my opinion, would like to control everything. But he can. But he can. It is true. And the, the problem with uh, <coughs> the um, elections to elect elections of, of, of uh, um, prosecutor uh, which should deal with some corruption uh, issue, issues is a, a best example of, of this. So leaders, Ukrainian leaders cannot accept or are not able to accept check and balance principles to some extent at least. And the question arises are they able to implement deep reforms which would establish a new system of Ukrainian politics and economy similar to the mature democracy? I think it is an open question. Because there is a lack of critical mass in political elite which would be ready to implement genuine reforms. What should be done? What can be done? First of all, a constant pressure on the political elite in Ukraine. And it is the only chance to build a new system and mature democracy there. The question is by who? First of all, by Ukrainian society, especially an active part of it, which is firmly pro European. Uh, and by the EU, the West as a whole, directly to um, Ukrainian authorities, but maybe more frequently through Ukrainian society. Because there is positive aspects, of course, because I'm maybe too, too pessimistic. There are positive aspects. First of all, new type of relations between an active part of society, NGOs, various groups, media, and, on the other hand, authorities of different levels. In my opinion, it is a revolutionary change which is not sufficiently recognized in the EU, but maybe also in, in Ukraine. This active part of society perce perceives themselves as an equal partner vis-a-vis -vis 
or firmness. And it is a kind of overcome uh, the Soviet, but I think also lot even longer legacy. So I think this is extremely important. This is a revolutionary change in political, social life in Ukraine in the last few years. And of course, the EU side should do something. I think that a new strategy, a of even philosophy from our EU side is badly needed. Namely, relations with society representatives should be treated as at least equal important <coughs> relations as relations with authorities. So I think that we will be witness of a battle between all system supporters and people who would like to establish a well-working, mature democracy in Ukraine in the next months and years. And all of this happened in still divided Ukrainian society. Because it is not a bigger support for European integration last year. However, Maria said this, uh, much lower than there is a much lower support for integration with the Eurasian Union, Russia. And probably a significant part of Ukrainians don't want now to integrate with anyone. And they prefer to choose own. Very good. Thank you very much. So with these five presentations, and uh, I thank you very much for really sticking to the time, uh, we have enough space for digging deeper and asking further questions. Uh, first, before I will ask the audience, I uh, wanted to ask whether the panelists themselves would like to comment on anything what they heard. Uh, and then we'll open it. Alexis, uh, corruption uh, survival strategy, uh, well, as Garcia suggested, or you would reframe that statement? Actually, I agree with everything which was said, almost everything which was said here, because I think, yes, it's necessary to criticize and to put the pressure for authorities. Two problems which I see. First of all, yes, uh, as Maria showed by the results of the polls, um, there is huge, at least there was a huge, and still huge enthusiasm for the EU, and dramatically dropped the number of those who are in favor of the uh, customs union. But we need to understand that, yes, on January 1st, there would be, uh, the DCFT will come into force, and it will coincide with a difficult economic situation in Ukraine. People do not know, not know much about DCFT, but they will judge by their own book. So it creates very favorable situation for the opponents of the authorities <coughs> to actually to criticize European choice. And they will say, look, Moscow was right. So I assume that, yeah, but we can, we can face decrease in the number of those who will support um, European integration. Perhaps it's natural, right? Because Euromaidan created, created exaggerated, uh, exaggerated. <coughs> but still, this would be a, a problem. And this is also one of the uh, part of the strategy of Putin to discredit EU integration of Ukraine, to discredit, to destabilize the situation, to use the democratic mechanism to stimulate ill parliamentary election and then produce a change. Okay, so here the strategy I think it's clear. To a certain extent it was done in Georgia as well. Uh, as to what to do, I fully agree with Jeb Jeb, yes. Uh, we are not satisfied with many things that Parashanka did in Ukraine. We are criticizing them. The question here is what, what to do, because, you know, we have the democratic channels of influence and definitely we need to use it, not to talk about my time three. Look, because, yes, the situation is that you, you have the whole situation, so you have the flood of armament from which anyway moves from that area to certain parts of Ukraine, which could be used. 
and which would lead to which could lead to violent clashes here. And instead, and again, who will benefit from it? I believe the answer is clear. So again, and here I agree with Judge that we need to use democratic channels and first of all lobbying through lobbying through the civil society. Sasha, thank you. Those who would like to speak, if you could just indicate with these main blacks, uh, I will be then giving you floor. Sasha. Ah, thank you very much for the floor. Uh, one comment and question that I'd like to invite Alexei uh, Aran and uh, Maria Zalkina to respond on. Because uh, it concerns decentralization concept. And for me, it's not clearly what will be the role of the, uh, you know, the sort of capacity of the central authorities to intervene into the decision making of the regional and local authorities. What is the role of the prefect from the regional level, which will be uh, subordinated to the president, and then you will have like the local uh, state administration, district state administrations, that could also monitor decision making of the local authorities within their district. And what is strange for me, again, that this, this situation simply doesn't solve the old structural problem of Ukrainian state administration system, because it might happen that in the only conflict between the government and the president of the central power level, it might be simply, you know, be just transposed, transposed to the regional and local. <coughs> so why that happened? Because I was unhappy when I was reading that, that but I, uh, you know, uh, just restored my memory the situation between Timoshenko and uh, Yushchenko, you know, after this, uh, the Orange Revolution. And if I simply, if you can just model such a situation, you will receive complete disaster. I understand that in terms of functioning of the public administration system, you know, even this role of the state prefect and something like that, it's something very specific. We, know that we do not have it in our country. Okay. So we have the regional self-governing authorities, we have the local self, and we have the division of powers and competencies and money. Here, what uh, actually we received in this Ukrainian sort of uh, uh, local, I mean, uh, this government administration reform, so again, I see uh, this as a problematic point which might be a problem in the future. So I'd like to invite you to elaborate on that. And, my second point goes to uh, Katarina Matanova and Kasia Volchuk. I mean the EMP review and what uh, Kasia Volchuk said, that Ukraine is expected following the provision of the association agreement to become a in 10 years. Yes, in the, in the sort of institutional setting of the agreement. And again, uh, uh, we discussed it several times during this conference in the previous years that actually there is a one very important difference between the EEA agreement of Norway and the association agreement with the CFT with Ukraine. And this is the status of observers in the working groups that the council. So my question to Katarina and maybe Kasia who want to elaborate on that, why this sort of reform or review of the EMP? Uh, and even, uh, even more, you said that this type of agreement gives an opportunity to change it if both sides agree. If we have, if we expect from Ukraine that it will simply meet all provisions of the accession agreement, and if you understand that it's a copy, almost a copy of the EU agreement in Norway, it's not a Liechtenstein, why Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia association countries, who are given to be like more prefer prefer preferential treatment from our side, why they are not given this right to help observers of the level of the working groups uh, within the council. Mm -hmm. So this is okay, Alex, Maria, and then Katarina Kasha. Oh. Sasha, thank you very much for raising this important issue. And why it's important? Because the constitutional changes which we were talking about, actually they introduce two different things which are in one basket. Decentralization which democratic opposition demanded for the kids and the special status for the occupied areas. And Parshanka actually deliberately put it in one basket. 
because decentralization is basically supported by Ukrainians, but, if, but most Ukrainians don't support special status. So he delivered to put it in one basket and got the majority. While in the West, uh, when uh, some Western politicians, experts, are talking about decentralization, they first of all are talking about special status uh, for the occupied area. So it's necessary for us to understand that decentralization is about giving broader rights to all the uh, districts and communes, because the communal level is the most important one to all places of Ukraine. Now, about this uh, decentralization, as I have said, it's demanded for decades. And what is very important, which has been done, until, pre until recently, uh, the, the uh, rayon and district and oblast levels, radars at councils at rayon and oblast level, they don't have their executive bodies, okay? Before the reform. All the executive power is concentrated in the hands of presidential supported, presidential appointed uh, heads of state administration. So there are others which can adopt different things, but the executive power is vested with presidential appointment. Now it's changed. So the others, all the others, they will have their executive body. That's, that's really important. And all the others have the possibility to adopt, but not only to adopt budget, but also to, to, to manage the budget, to operate, to operate the budget. Again, these are two very important, two important changes. As to the role. Uh, or because there would be no more heads of state administration, but there would be so-called prefects. And the term is used from present French system, where they have the system, they are to supervise the activity of the bodies of self government and to watch whether these bodies do not exceed their rights and uh, their comp uh, competences. Uh, again, this system exists in France, and uh, why it is used in Ukraine, again, it's connected with, uh, I believe, to a great extent, it's connected with uh, the spread of separatism, that, you know, you can have local rights which will exceed the authority and declare something. Um, Sasha, I put, I'm not specialist on decentralization, so actually the question which you put to me in Ukraine, I asked, uh, my colleagues who are experts in this, and they said among the Viga Kalyushka, famous expert, he said that basically the changes in the constitution, you know, they are more or less, more or less okay. A lot would depend what would be the laws which would be, should be adopted after the constitutional changes are introduced. A lot would depend on it. So I was hoping. May I add several words? Uh, according to preliminary evaluations of experts on this, this transition, I'm not a expert on this transition, but I know the evaluations that we need to um, either adopt or uh, change about uh, uh, four or five countries of legislation, of legisl of acts of legislation in Ukraine in order to fill the concept of decentralization and the, the concept actually of the reform. Uh, with concrete meaning and uh, the number of competencies of uh, the prefect, they are not clear and they are just discussed as of now, so the legislation act on that is just is on the face of being prepared. And uh, one more important uh, issue that I would underline is that uh, decentralization seems to be a rather important reform which actually really was demanded, but nevertheless we still have the problem which I hope we will overcome in the coming months uh, and start um, intensive communication campaign on that with, the side, with society because not only politicians or a lot of like, experts or journalists don't understand how it will look like, 
but it is much more important that if uh, constitutional reform is actually adopted uh, in the second uh, hearing in the parliament, then we have two years to prepare local communities uh, to get to um, to um, give them knowledge about what their competencies would be and how the system uh, should look like. Because as of now, people uh, don't know about current possibilities of how to control authorities in a local level, and sometimes it is a crucial important. For example, uh, last month we conducted uh, the representative public opinion poll uh, exactly in Lugansk and in the Nets region and the liberated areas. I mean. And um, the relative majority of people think that either they can't um, uh, control local authorities at all, or they don't know when they have such possibilities actually. And this is in the in the framework of assistance of a system which is stable and normal. But if we will come to implementation of a new concept of a new system of relations between some local self governments and central authorities, we have a challenge to explain to you before 2017 how it should look like. Thank you very much. Uh, Sasha, I'm not sure I distilled the questions uh, correctly, so I'll uh, uh, rephrase them. First, you were asking why being in peer review when nothing is really changing with the association agreement and the DCFTA. Is that a correct question? Mm, yes, uh, it's about the institutional setting of the association agreement with Ukraine. Because actually, it's equal to this argument raised by Prashka, and it's really, so we did research on that. So it's, it's identical, almost identical agreement, EA and association agreement. But with this Norwegian, this time in Liechtenstein, Island agreements, there is a status of observers. This would be with something like plus for Ukraine, you know, opening of the institution. Even the status of not membership, still we are speaking, but it is a part of this Norwegian agreement, and whether there is any debate within the Commission to work on such perspective also for you. That I understood as your second question. So there were only one. Okay. There was only one question. Uh, well, look, uh, the adoption of the uh, or coming into force of the first provisional, and then hopefully. Uh, despite referenda and various votes, and thanks to Slovakia for having already ratified the, uh, the association agreement. Once it comes into force, um, it's the beginning of the process, it's not the end. And uh, the, the level of uh, adoption of the acquis uh, with Liechtenstein and uh, Norway is very different than with Ukraine or Moldova or, or Tunisia or uh, Georgia at the moment. So there is definitely a debate. There, there are some formations in which uh, the, this, the association partners are already already called, but there is definitely a perspective that those are going to be increasing as the as the uh, integration uh, goes further. And as Kasia was mentioning, it is a flexible instrument. That's why also the timing it's not set in stone. It's as as far as the capacity and will continue. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative process and definitely uh, definitely uh, participation of, um, of associated uh, uh, countries or countries under association agreement is debated and will be, will be introduced as the, as the time goes on. I just want to comment one thing because a lot was mentioned about the DCFDA and I completely agree with Kasia. It's about as exciting a process as you can imagine. And, uh, and, and that's why communication is, a, is key. Uh, I'm going to, uh, by the way, the commissioner is going and I'm going as well to the, to the civil society forum in Kiev because we really think that your, the point that you made, Gregor, about the need to engage with civil society is something that's very much felt um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a given. And whenever I go, whether to Georgia or to to Kiev, uh, I want to meet with business associations and agricultural associations, etc., to talk to people and, and, and explain that why it may not make sense, why you cannot have only 30 centimeters of tiles when you are raising uh, cows, that you have to have two tiles. It actually has a direct impact on your market access and on, on your uh, phytosanitary clearances, etc. So. Uh, it's, it's boring, it's technocratic, but it has a huge potential and, and, and I think the point that Kasha made that it's going to come with actual costs at the beginning rather than benefits, 
Uh, that's why we are now um, in the process of finalizing a DCFPA facility, including coming up with a better name for it than DCFPA facility, to help the, the uh, local businesses to, to adapt to the changes and provide, uh, provide TA, provide financial support uh, uh, so they can, can come to the standards and start using the, the market access uh, to their benefit to them. Thank you. Perhaps I'll just come back to the issue of democracy versus implementation and reforms. The issue is that it's very paradoxical, almost ironical, that whenever Ukraine is democratized, it's also more paralyzed or decision making is more difficult. We Ukraine basically have two versions of the constitution, the 1996 constitution, which was very much, much liked by people like President Yanukovych. Um, for very good reasons, because it's created a very strong presidency, which dominated the political landscape, and was not necessarily conducive to reforms. Then we have the 2004 version, which was introduced after the Orange Revolution and after the Maidan, which is more democratic, but makes decision-making more difficult, because the executive is split between the president and prime minister, there's probably coordination and competition, and this creates a lot of frustration. So Ukraine is a classic example of doing reforms and building democracy at the same time. And it's not an easy sort of um, work in tandem, but there are sort of tensions. Um, I think the, the new Ukrainian authorities have done better than any previous government in terms of actually interaction between the prime minister and the president. Despite all the tensions and problems, nevertheless, we have not seen this sort of infighting, open infighting, which basically led to um, Paralysis, like after the Orange Revolution, or domination of the presidency, like under Yanukovych and Kuchma. So I think that this, the complex constitutional framework needs to be appreciated. And the issue of, um, I think, um, Alexander, this idea about sort of, a, it's a brilliant example of thinking outside the box. Um, in terms of providing symbolism and vision, which seems to be the deficit of it. Uh, within sort of the context of EU-Ukraine relations, sustaining Ukraine on the sort of European path. Um, and it's, it's, I think the legal mechanism, that it's a multilateral agreement, I mean, this is a, a bilateral, but some kind of inclusion symbolist sort of recognition um, would be very much welcome. And I'm sure there is sort of sufficient capacity inside the EU to think uh, in those terms. But the, the narrative is basically about the, the naivety uh, of the European dream. This comes sort of especially from, um, from Moscow. And the perception, I think it's important for the EU, at the moment the perception seems to be, at least for, the, for Ukraine, is that the EU doesn't care enough about Ukraine, about the European choice of Ukraine, and Russia cares too much. Um, so it's really, um, and I think the large deflated Liga summit did not send the right kind of signal that we are all together in this. So I think this is sort of the short, the time framework has shortened radically because of what has happened, and we don't have that framework that we used to have. So it's about um, <coughs> problem solving on the ground, sort of non nonsense solutions, and perhaps thinking creatively whether the poor farmers in Transcarpathia, uh, not far from the Slovak border, really need to you know, implement the trials, or perhaps we are talking about selected businesses in Ukraine which want to uh, export to the EU market. And it's about packaging and selling that prospect of integration, something which Slovakia experienced, basically, to stay on that path. Now we have to replicate in Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia without the membership perspective on the table, and that's the challenge. Thank you, I see. Okay, please go ahead. Can you? Yes. So my name is Louise Lacko from the European Council of Foreign Relations. I'm very happy um, that some of the panelists kept uh, mentioning the word um, democracy. And I want to turn the question into more of a meta question to um, Ms. Matelova. When speaking about the revision of European legal policy, um, I've been reading a lot recently so-called sneak reviews by the commissioner, and I unfortunately couldn't find anywhere the word democracy. So I was wondering what has happened to it. My second question is, um, 
Does that necessarily mean that we're going from neighborhood partnership relations to basically a real politic for a policy approach to our neighbors? And my third question is, um, since with the revision of 2011, we kind of tried to bring in promotion of deep and sustainable democracy, does our current shift to so-called postmodern um, objectives mean that we are admitting that we basically failed in our democratization um, approaches to our neighbors? Okay, Katarina. Finally, you've got questions which you ask for. Oh, sorry. No, no, absolutely right. Uh, I, I um, uh, wouldn't put it necessarily in the words that uh, you framed it, uh, but uh, there is definitely, there is definitely uh, a better balance between interests and values. And I think that uh, it's a little bit a, a recognition uh, again, a self-critical recognition by the EU of not being very good at imposing its, uh, its, its values on, onto others. So I think there is, uh, this is not to say that we are retreating from supporting democracy, not at all. You can look at, the, um, for example, the democracy support and civil society support uh, that we are tripping uh, in the period, I, I, I can check the figures and get, get the exact ones, but there is not at all a retreat from, uh, from uh, supporting democracy, supporting uh, pluralistic uh, discourse and, uh, and the institutions that, that uh, uh, underpin it. Uh, but I think that there is a recognition of, of uh, sort of wanting people to look like us uh, recognizing that there is a limit to that, and there is a limit to that ambition. So in that sense, it, in that sense, it's less ambitious, but I think it's more it's less ambitious, but more realistic, and still ambitious with uh, with uh, the, the partners that uh, make similar choices. I think that if you ask me, is there going to be a, a complete real politic uh, look at? Uh, Choose a um, you know smaller oil-rich country in the eastern neighborhood. Uh, are there going to be no limits to the to wanting to engage? Uh, and uh, things are not going to be put on the table that are problematic in the country. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that there is a, a shift that you will suddenly uh, suddenly uh, see um, uh, that would that would change the that would change the picture completely. But I think that there is going to be uh, an interest in in uh, identifying the identifying <coughs> the areas of, of common interest and within those uh, press the values rather than rather than imposing our our own set. Thank you. Uh, uh, please go ahead over there. Just introduce yourself, please. some technical movements which are bureaucratic one in some 
cabinets, uh, but nevertheless we don't have explanations on the side of uh, authorities how the DCTA will actually work and what will be the results in the short term or the mid-term perspective. This is a mistake, I think, and it will be uh, a problem. Uh, but nevertheless, we should just start. And in this regard, non-governmental actors are much more effective already. They are much more effective in explaining people what is DCT, what is association agreement is in fact, than uh, state authorities. Moreover, we have one more actor, which is uh, a foreign one, but which uh, at a domestic level in Ukraine uh, is very uh, successful in explaining Ukrainians what is DCT. This is the delegation of the European Union because uh, they are really conducting uh, campaigns on, uh, uh, all over the country, like explaining to people uh, what this agreement is and uh, what will benefits and costs of this of implementation of this, of this agreement would be. Uh, information which, is go which goes from the government is not sufficient, yes, uh, and uh, we have. Um, we have fixed it uh, in the framework of uh, our public opinion polls because people are interested in getting uh, clear and understandable information on how reforms are going on. But nevertheless, uh, it is about one quarter of population which say that uh, there is an information which goes from the government about reforms, but, but people don't understand actually the whole process, how it looks like. So the information is unclear, but it, but it is present. And uh, it is about 28% uh, uh, um, of people who say that there is a deficit of information. So we have the space which uh, is partially uh, filled with activities of uh, non-governmental actors, non-governmental campaigns uh, are conducted uh, in order to explain to people the current situation and prospects, but this space should be, uh, wouldn't be totally filled with kind of concrete and uh, reliable information without authorities, and in this regard, I think the, the sooner they start, the better, actually. They can, they can, of course, just, just to explain to people at least uh, what will be the short-term results of studying and implementing DCT, because all the information, you know, it's not the constant analysis, of course, but uh, all the information which goes um, from the state authorities about uh, DCFTA is, is uh, like about uh, trilateral consultations and uh, political conflicts and attempts of Russia to, uh, to influence uh, tempos of implementation or terms or so on, but not, uh, it's, this information is not about DCFTA itself. Please go ahead. Well, communication is important, definitely, and we need, but we need also to remember that most of the channels now are in the hands of the oligarchs. So, you mentioned that they are independent. Pardon? You mentioned in your introductory statement. Look, 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 I mean, they are not under pressure, no, 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 I didn't say that. We, they are not under the control of state authorities. There is no censorship here, okay? But they are oligarchically controlled. And they are free in criticizing the government, okay? And they enjoyed it during the local elections campaign, you know, to the full extent. Moreover, even in, on uh, Prashanka's, Prashanka's channel, there is a criticism of president. You know, so uh, definitely there is a need uh, of communication, but at the same time, we need to have visible results reforms. And I believe, I will repeat it, I believe this visible results could be connected with fighting corruption and reform of law enforcing agents. I believe this is the key. And that is why target investment pressure in this sphere is very, very important. For example, like what uh, the statements of American ambassador regarding the blocking of reforms from prosecuted charity. So this interference, I would welcome. Sure, please go ahead. And one more example of how um, actually um, control or sometimes pressure on the side of uh, the EU can be successful is uh, the situation around anti-corruption bureau because the delegation is um, actively involved in looking how the situation is going on there and they make official statements on that. 
And uh, another one issue is uh, the situation with civil service reform because it started uh, like, uh, facing some obstacles, mainly political ones, but nevertheless uh, the legislation is almost ready and it is the compromise. So the position of uh, the EU was very, the delegation of the EU was very uh, important because it was, it was open and it was official. Okay, so if I don't, uh, Alexei, since you have to leave a little earlier than other panelists, I have a question to you. The, your system is rather peculiar. You have pluralistic, but multi-centric, oligarchic uh, power uh, game in your country, which is very complicated to understand. If you could, uh, yeah, because in, uh, in other countries you have one or two powerful and for us outsiders need to understand it. But you just said that you have multiple channels owned by oligarchs, several of your people, I mean, the system is democratic, but uh, question about charismatic leaders in your country. Public opinion polls are saying what? Who are top three or top five most charismatic, popular politicians which are shaping public attitudes. And we heard that Yulia Tymoshenko is coming back again. Can she make it? Guess who is number one in the polls in the democratic country? In Moldova, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the case, and that's because of Putin's polls. Well, if you analyze the polls, so if you, if you have presidential elections or parliamentary elections, by, despite the fall in ratings, number one is President Prussia. Okay, and the same is true for his party. But if China made increase in the polls, and this is understandable because but if China, I mean, the Mashanka's party is in they find their niche. Formally, they are within coalition government. In fact, they are in opposition criticizing both president and prime minister. And I think it's wise for Tymoshenko not to leave the coalition because otherwise she would be blamed for splitting the coalition. So actually, she is enjoying formally being part of the coalition and formally they have one minister of sport and, of sport and use in uh, in the government, but at the same time enjoying the criticism. Uh, so this is the explanation of uh, race in the polling. But if you analyze the results of the local election, this increase appeared not to be as dramatic as predicted. So uh, according to the polls, it's about 90%. Poroshenko is slightly ahead Poroshenko's block, but during the elections, they got about local election, approximately about 12% uh, throughout the whole country. Which, so Tymoshenko continues her game, she's a skillful politician, um, but I think it would be still difficult for her to make a comeback because she, she is viewed like representing the old God, you know, the old generation of politicians. Actually, even for Poroshenko, this is, you know, this is, this is difficult to present himself as a new style leader, and you know that his dynamics and results in the presidential elections they were uh, skyrocketed. They skyrocketed very much, but uh, now there's a criticism, and we need to understand here that Parshanka, as a person, he's not a revolutionary. You know, he believes he believes in compromises, in you know balancing the system, moving, moving cautiously ahead. So this, this is his style. So, and uh, I think the personality of Poroshenko just confirms what I have said, that in Ukraine we will have not radical changes, but evolutionary ones. Okay, so if I don't see any uh, Anybody else? So we just concluded with you. So unless any panelists would have to ask, say, if not, Sasha. Okay, Sasha. With these, I think that this group likes coffee breaks a lot, so we will have longer coffee break, and then Sasha will tell you when you need to come back to the afternoon. Please join me thanking all panelists and I declare. Okay, uh, let me.